it had already done its stuff very adequately, brilliantly, in the Battle of Britain. Now for me, it was going to be the Hurricane. Mark you, the Hurricane did most of the work in the Battle of Britain. Well, I was a very inexperienced Hurricane pilot at the time, and the time was, by date, 1941, November. And um, I took this hurricane on a, on a flight over Glasgow. I was a little bit distressed to notice that my temperature of the engine was going up and up and up. And this wasn't funny because um, I'd had a glycol leak before. And a glycol, of course, is uh, a glycol leak. It's the equivalent of getting a, an antifreeze leak in your motor car. So I took the revs down a bit, but still the temperatures went up. So I decided to shut down the engine, which I did. And I s slammed the switches off and entered cloud at about 6,000 feet. When I got to 5,500 feet, I remembered that the mountains in the area were somewhere in the region of 2,500 to 3,000 feet. So I decided at two and a half thousand feet that there was no health in staying with this airplane because I could easily hit the mountains. So I slid back the cockpit hood and uh, put my hands up and dragged myself up. And the airplane wobbled and instinctively, I don't know why I did it, but just instinctively I sat down again. But then I realized when I looked at my altimeter that I was down to under 2,000 feet and to bail out at that 2,000 feet with mountains at 2,000 feet was going to be just as disastrous as staying with the airplane. And I broke cloud at 900 feet. I was delighted to see the ground for the first time and I hadn't got a lot of time to make my mind up what I was going to do with the airplane. But I'd gone through a period of, of uh, wondering whether I was going to live or not. I didn't, it didn't frighten me, but I was certainly aware of the fact that um, I could easily die. I saw a little, a little farmhouse, and there was a few cattle around and a few sheep, as one would expect to see in the, in the area. I selected the fields near the farmhouse because I knew that if I turned the airplane over on landing, that maybe there was somebody who would come and dig me out rather than leave me in a burning bit of equipment. There was no way with this B aeroplane going to go down. It wouldn't land. It just, I was feeling it down, but it, I couldn't get it down. It wouldn't stall in. Finally, when I saw a flaming great mound uh, in front of me, and I thought, no, I'm not going to hit that because it was about 20, 30 feet high and I was only at about 15 or 20 feet up. So I gently eased the stick forward until the old hurricane nosed into the ground. Well, the hurricane had a huge radiator underneath the engine and that, of course, acted as a scoop and it stopped the airplane pretty fast. Um, and when the airplane stopped, I didn't. So I shot forward and hit my face on the gun sight. But I did miss this flaming great mound and um, there was blood pouring out of everywhere. As I got into the ambulance, I said to the farmer, I said, by the way, where am I? And he said, you're at Gillsland. And I said to the farmer, I said, uh, by the way, what was that bloody great mound over there? And he said, oh, can it? Well, I said, you'd never knock that down, that's Hadrian's Wall. And of all the places, I had chosen Hadrian's Wall to land on. Uh, but I got away with that one. That was a, about the only hairy time I ever had with a hurricane. The hurricane story starts long before any conflict with Hadrian's Wall. It dates back as far as the history of aviation itself, to the times of King Edward VII's coronation at the beginning of this century. Though Kitty Hawk, USA, was the site for the first sustained flight, it was Europe, particularly France, that saw most of the aeroplane's early development.
The biplanes were originally in the ascendancy, but it was a monoplane that made one of the first significant breakthroughs. Louis Blériot took off from French soil on July the 25th, 1909, in his own Blériot 11 bis, and conquered the English Channel. That same year, 1909, at a competition in Reims, France, it was a monoplane that won the Champagne Contest for distance, the meeting's most coveted prize. So the monoplane was doing well. But then things started to go wrong. A series of accidents due to structural failures led the English War Office to impose a ban on single-wing machines. Though this ban would only last for a few months, it continued to influence official thinking for many years to come. And it was again the biplane that surged ahead. Planes like the de Havilland and the Sopwith here. This was the situation at the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. When the freshly recruited volunteers arrived at the front in northern France, the planes overhead were, without exception, biplanes of various manufacture, whether German, French, British, or later American. The war that was supposed to last for a few brief months finally came to a close in 1918 and brought significant social changes. Women's position in society had to be redefined. Sports became the entertainment for the many rather than a pastime for the privileged few. And most importantly, technology fired the imagination of everybody, however it was presented, and not least, the aeroplane. Air displays had become a popular spectator sport and joyrides were available at virtually every one of the numerous new aerodromes being established throughout Europe. Increased reliability now also meant that the aeroplane could be used for wider practical purposes. In 1919, the RAF established the first scheduled aerial post between Hawking and the British forces on the Rhine. This first service was rapidly built into a larger network and formed the basis for a wider and very useful aerial postal service. There were many challenges for the aircraft in these early pioneering days. Great stretches of oceans yet to be conquered. Mountains to be crossed. And vast deserts to be overcome. An American team had made it across the Atlantic, but with a stopover in the Azores. The first successful non-stop attempt was made by Alcott and Brown when they flew a Vickers-constructed biplane from Newfoundland towards Ireland, finishing up in a local bog, but without sustaining any personal injuries. Ross and Keith Smith made it to Australia. Cobham reached Cape Town. Hinkland from Croydon to Darwin in 15 days. Gino Watkins mastered the Arctic. Amongst the women pioneers were Amy Johnson, here seen returning from her England to Australia flight in an Argosy, and to a tumultuous welcome. The first solo non-stop crossing of the Atlantic was made by Charles Lindbergh in 1927, in his Spirit of St. Louis. And still to this day, the flight we associate with Atlantic crossing. He is welcomed home to the USA with a hero's ticker tape parade. The Germans were pushing their own frontiers by developing larger and larger airships, culminating with the now infamous Hindenburg. Docking in New Jersey after her maiden flight from Germany to the USA, 
the Hindenburg exploded in a ball of flames, killing almost all her passengers and crew. The cause of this accident has been a mystery ever since. Accident, act of God, or more sinister sabotage. Whatever the reason, this was the biggest aviation disaster to date. The successes and even the tragedies in aviation in the 1920s and 30s resulted in a rapid development program, though in the main within biplanes. The public's interest in aviation was unabated over those years, and thousands attended the yearly air show at Hendon in North London, where they were treated to the best aerobatics display to be seen anywhere. In 1935, the RAF marked King George V's Jubilee with a great review. It was a great occasion, but would also be a great farewell to the biplane. The brief ban on monoplanes had been influencing the Air Ministry's decisions for 23 years, but this impressive display was in reality the biplane swan song. A new and impressive single-wing fighter plane was waiting in the wings. The Hawker Hurricane first made headlines on the 11th of February 1938. On the previous afternoon, squadron leader J.W. Gillen had flown one of these new fighters from Turnhouse in Scotland to Northolt near London. A distance of 327 miles in 48 minutes averaging 409 miles per hour. The fact that this high speed only had been achieved because of an exceptionally fast tailwind was not mentioned in any official statement. The intention was to achieve maximum publicity effect and for two reasons. Firstly, to encourage the British people by intimating that a new and revolutionary fighter was available to defend the country. Neville Chamberlain notwithstanding, there was a real fear of war. And secondly, offsetting the recent achievement of the German BF-109 designed by Willy Messerschmitt. The 109 had created headlines of its own during the summer of 1937, winning climb, dive and speed competitions, as well as the Circuit of the Alps race. The 109 had also captured the world speed record for land planes, reaching 379.38 miles per hour, with a specially supercharged engine on the 11th of November 1937. And it may indeed have been this record that made the British claim for the hurricane believable to the Germans. The first Hurricanes had been delivered to number 111 squadron at RAF Northolt in December 1937. But the plane's history stemmed back as far as 1933, when Hawker's chief designer, Sidney Cam, met with the Air Ministry's Directorate of Technical Development to discuss the prospect for a monoplane fighter. However, the idea of monoplane was, in those days, anathema to official thinking. Despite the success of monoplanes competing for the Schneider Trophy, and the fact that the Italian Macchi MC-72 monoplane had established a world speed record of 423.82 miles per hour. But Hawker Aircraft decided to go ahead and designed a monoplane fighter based on the Hawker Fury biplane. Initially, using the Rolls-Royce Goshawk engine, 
though this was later replaced by the stronger Rolls-Royce PV12 engine. This was the engine that led directly to the famous Merlin. The prototype was constructed around the Air Ministry specification F36-34 and was first flown on the 6th of November 1935. Official trials began in February 1936. The plane that took to the air then was powered by the 990 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin C engine, driving a two-blade fixed pitch propeller and with fabric covered wings and fuselage. The trials were successful, and even the most optimistic speed predictions were easily exceeded. On the 3rd of June 1936, Hawker received an initial order for 600 Hurricanes, and a new chapter in the RAF's history was launched. The Hurricane 1 was, as mentioned, first delivered to number 111 Squadron, and soon afterwards, numbers 3 and 56 Squadrons were also equipped. And by the end of 1938, about 200 Hurricanes had been delivered to RAF Fighter Command. During the production run of the Hurricane 1, totaling almost 4,000 aircraft, a number of improvements were made. The two-blade propeller was replaced by a de Havilland three-blade, and the wing had been replaced by one with metal stress skin. Other improvements included the Merlin three engine, a bulletproof windscreen, and some armor protection for the pilot. The Hurricane armament came throughout the Second World War in a variety of configurations. Early on, it was equipped with eight 7.7mm machine guns. A new wing allowed for no less than 12 machine guns, in addition to which it could carry two 250 or 500 pound bombs. Later, the machine guns were replaced by four 20mm cannons, and some versions even sported two 40mm anti-tank guns. The story of the Hawker Hurricane is, as we've seen, inextricably linked to the competition between monoplanes and biplanes. And as a combat aircraft, a fighter, the Hurricane would in so many ways be the best argument for its type. I was given a book and told to get into a hurricane and fly it. Now most, I think, young pilots would say, uh, well, I flew a hurricane and it was, it was easy. Well, for me it wasn't. And I've got proof of it because it's in my diary. On Friday, the 16th of October, 1942, I flew a Miles Master for 20 minutes and then I pushed off in a hurricane. I was very careful indeed. I'm sure that it took me 20 minutes to do, even do the cockpit check and I carried that out about three times. Eventually I was ready to go. I opened the throttle and I got off okay. I fumbled and was unable to find the undercart lever. There was terrible moments. I was expecting to spin the aircraft in at any moment. The aircraft was bucking about all over the bloody place. I climbed to 1,000 feet, and then I selected wheels down, found myself at 1,700 feet. I forgot my radio procedure completely. I was un unable to remember my call sign, but suddenly I came across wind on my landing run. I turned into land, and it all became calm and this airplane came in as gentle and an easy as a bird. And then I had, now at long last, a hurricane has flown me.
It was not to be long after its record-breaking flight that the hurricane was to be given a chance to prove its true worth. Europe was about to go to war. The signs from Germany were only too clear, and the British government started full-scale rearmament, stepping up production of vital equipment. The RAF recruited and trained thousands of young men to fly their Spitfires and Hurricanes in the battles that were sure to come. In Germany, after the Anschluss of Austria and the invasion of Czechoslovakia, Hitler and his staff were planning the imminent attack on Poland ignoring the French and British ultimatum, attack Poland and we declare war. So the French and British notwithstanding, Germany launch a ferocious attack on Poland on the 1st of September 1939. And the world witnessed for the first time Blitzkrieg at its most devastating. Virtually all Polish resistance was eliminated within six weeks. Despite the French and British declaration of war, there were no serious hostilities between Germany and the Allies in the wake of the attack of Poland, and it was hardly surprising that Hitler was more than willing to take the next step. He invaded France the following spring, and finally England and France were forced into action. The British Expeditionary Force and French regulars were now preparing for the imminent German assault on France, which was swift to come, with the German panzers bypassing the Maginot Line at the Ardennes Forest. The BEF had been reinforced with three Hurricane Squadrons, who, for the first time, encountered the highly efficient ME-109. Against the 109s, well, uh, the hurricane, of course, was slower than the 109. It wasn't without its problems. Yes, there certainly were problems, but the hurricanes fought valiantly and did manage to inflict some serious damage on the Luftwaffe, who had the disadvantage of very long supply lines. The end result was, however, never really in question. The German divisions were unstoppable despite brave attempts at places like Arras. Allied soldiers and French refugees were pushed further and further west. The subsequent evacuation of more than 300,000 troops from the beaches of Dunkirk was a miracle, but still a devastating defeat for the Allies. There was now only a few miles of water between the Germans and England, and Stukas could freely attack British shipping. But Germany's high command decided to finish the French campaign before any invasion could be contemplated. The remaining French forces did not pose any serious opposition to the German divisions, and when Paris fell, the French were faced with the humiliation of having to surrender in the very same railway carriage that only a few years earlier had witnessed the Germans signing the Versailles Treaty. Now flush with success, Hermann Goering promised Hitler that his Luftwaffe could adequately deal with not only the British fleet in the Channel, but with the RAF, and thereby making the coming invasion a certain success. But his Stukas and even ME-109s came up against unexpected tough opposition from RAF Fighter Command. The fighting was so fierce that the area around Dover became known as Hell's Corner.
we had a big day on, on Dover where we clobbered quite a lot of them. And I'd rush back to refuel. And um, at Hawking, we were sitting in the cockpit, and the armourers were refilling the wings with ammunition, and the chaps were pumping fuel in. And the chap who was pumping fuel in, of course, was standing by the cockpit with his hose stuck into the tank. And I was watching, looking up, and there was a battle going on above us. One of the 109s was shot down. The chap filling the, my tank was watching as well. And suddenly a, a body jumped out of the 109 and a parachute blossomed. And some pilot came floating down. And uh, my refueler looked at me with a look of utter disgust on his face and said, first he said, good, hooray, we've got one. And then the disgust appeared and he said, oh, look, that jammy bastard, he's bailed out. <laughs> he was very upset about that. <laughs> Yet again, Goering failed to read the signs. He now decided that attack on harbour installations in southern England was just what was needed. It did not work. Supplies were still coming through with little or no difficulties. Orders were now coming through from Hitler to step up efforts, and waves of bombers supported by fighter planes were launched against southern England and the military installations placed there. Listening posts placed throughout England's southern coast gave fighter command a fair chance to scramble its Spitfires and Hurricanes to take up what did appear as an uneven fight. But these early days of what was later to become known as the Battle of Britain proved what the combination of determination, sound strategies and good equipment could achieve. Not all strategies worked out as designed. As the faster aircraft, the Spitfires were designated to deal with the ME-109s, whilst the Hurricanes should concentrate on the bombers. That was the plan, and so, whereas we'd been two hurricane squadrons to start with at Biggin Hill, one of them was moved out and replaced with the Spitfire squadron. The idea being, as you say, that the Spitfires would all go off together, Spitfires would take on the fighter escort, leaving us free to attack the bombs. Really happened. Very often, as I was getting in range of the bombers, I was being jumped by the fighters. And the Spitfires were busy mingling with the fighters, but there were enough German fighters to say, OK, we've got chaps to play with them, and, uh, and we'll take on these hurricanes. So I shot down the odd bomber, but just about everything I shot down was a fighter, because I kept getting tangled up with them. One of the major targets for the German bombing raids were British airfields. But their success was limited as most planes on the ground were heavily camouflaged. And German losses kept mounting. Despite the hurricane's success, it was the Spitfire that came out of the Battle of Britain covered with glory, as this informational propaganda film indicates.
But when you think about it, the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire was outnumbered two to one by the Hurricane. Um, and so in, in effect, you should, one would have thought that the Hurricane should have been the aircraft that came along with the highest honours. But no, the Hurricane has, you know, if you read any sort of book or anything, the Hurricane it hardly mentioned for some extraordinary reason, and yet the Spitfire comes out as the sort of saviour of the battle. But mark you, the Hurricane did most of the work in the battle, but... They were both superb, that goes without saying. Um, looking at the two aircraft side by side, they are totally different in uh, design. Uh, they, okay, they're single, they're monoplane fighters, and they both carried eight guns and things of that sort. But having said that, uh, they were quite different structurally because uh, the Hurricane, of course, was that much uh, before the Spitfire. Uh, a lot of it was canvas. The Spitfire is all metal. Uh, but comparing the two aircraft is, is a bit unfair in a way because I don't think it's comparing like with like. Hurricane was that much earlier. It had already done its stuff very adequately, brilliantly, in the Battle of Britain when there were 2.5 Hurricanes to every Spitfire. Yes, and the Hurricane also accounted for two thirds of all the kills, proving itself extremely efficient. And now England had started to hit back. Wellington bombers were making daily sorties against German targets on the continent. And the reactions from Hitler and his generals were to target London and its civilian population. three miles southwest. Scout for hostile planes approaching from the southwest. German losses were considerable and the loss of highly trained pilots either interned as prisoners of war or killed was a big blow to the Luftwaffe that it never really recovered from. London didn't escape unscathed. Despite fighter command's best efforts, bombers still got through and some 30,000 civilians were killed during this period. But the population's fighting spirit might just have been reflected in this propaganda film made at the time. Time. 
me. I thought they'd got you. Who, me? Nah, I had me fingers crossed. Despite the ruins, London was not yet a broken city, and the Luftwaffe kept piling on as much pressure as they were now capable of, though the emphasis was on more fighters and less bombers. Maybe the Luftwaffe simply had fewer bombers available. But whatever they sent, the Hurricane pilots were still eager to do battle. I came across, after a battle, four 109s um, on their way home, on their own in a V formation. And I thought, uh, uh, this is splendid. They haven't seen me. I shall just creep up behind them and pick them off one by one. And when I got closer, almost within range, the one on the right started veering off the right, and I knew he was looking over his shoulder and could see me coming up behind. And I thought, fine, that's all right. I'll be satisfied with one. I'll pick him off. Forget the other three. Big, big, big mistake. Because as I opened fire on him, he pulled up into a steep climb and piled the power on. And meanwhile, all hell broke loose behind me, things thumping into my aeroplane and making horrid holes. And of course, I'd take my eyes off the other three. The wonderful trap that was laid. <laughs> I was furious. I was livid. I was frightened and I was very angry. In Berlin, Hitler was still, despite the evidence, assuring the German people that the Luftwaffe was victorious in the skies over England. But things were changing rapidly. British Lancaster bombers made their biggest bombing attack on a target within Germany, the city of Bremen. The city and vital harbour installations were devastated. Finally, some attention was removed from Fighter Command Spitfires and Hurricanes. But Goering wanted revenge for this audacity and launched an all-out attack on the city of Coventry and its civilian population. An attack reminiscent of the total destruction of Rotterdam a few months earlier. Coventry was smashed as badly as the Polish capital of Warsaw during the Polish campaign. The people of Coventry dug their loved ones out of the blasted ruins, saw them to their last resting place in a common grave.
Between Coventry and London, more than 70,000 Englishmen, women and children lost their lives. Thousands more were injured. The King and Queen visited, but the spirit of the nation was yet again represented by the common people. We've been bombed, dive bombed, high level bombed, machine gunned, been through two invasion scares. The last lot we had, we had the house down about our ears. But we're still sticking it, and we're going to stick it. It was very much a ju just cause. Uh, there wasn't really any option. Um, I had joined the Air Force as a career. No option or just cause. Events in London and Coventry and the excesses of the Nazi regime were powerful motivations for joining fighter command or other branches of the armed forces. Joseph Goebbels' successful propaganda against German Jews, dating back to the early days of the Nazi administration, was known throughout Europe and viewed with increased distaste. But what was to follow could not easily be believed, let alone understood. In those days, we knew nothing about Holocaust. Uh, although I did know a little bit about it, because Les Cahoon and I used to dance at the Ealing YWCA every Saturday night with one particular German girl called Ursula. And she was a tall, fair good looking dame. She used to wear corsets, and we thought that was a bit strange. She was a bone tight all the way up. When you dance the last waltz with her, it was like dancing with a brick. <laughs> 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 but, um, but really, uh, she was a lovely girl, and we knew something of the, um, of the troubles and trials that the German Jewesses and Jews have had. The showers and the ovens were efficiently run and could stand up to the inspection of the man in charge, Heinrich Himmler, even though he found the smell a little nauseating. There is no describing this human suffering. It is beyond both our intellectual and emotional comprehension. Adolf Eichmann knew this when he claimed that the world would be outraged if it became known that three children had been gassed, but if you gassed 3,000, you could get away with it. It was just too unbelievable if sanity had to be preserved. And Hitler let himself be applauded by the people who could only recognize the hero and not the villain. One was very afraid that uh, if we lost, the Germans would, could invade us, and uh, my wife, I was married in 1939, in March, before war started, just before. Um, my wife would probably finish up in a German brothel, and I'd be shot against a wall or something. So, uh, you didn't really have much option other than to get stuck in.
Oil is vital for any war effort, and the Middle Eastern oil fields in Allied hands had to be protected at all costs. The task for the British 7th Army, later to become known as the Desert Rats. The first hostilities were instigated by General Graziani's Italian forces, but they were easily dealt with by the British, though they were relying on outdated equipment, including ancient biplanes. Most of the Italians were taken prisoner, a long time before they could get within sight of the mosques of Cairo. It was a far more significant confrontation when Rommel's Africa Corps faced Montgomery's desert rats at the battles of El Alamein. Though often seen as predominantly a tank battle, air power played an important role on both sides. So I went back on another ship to West Africa and then flew across from uh, Takaradi in West Africa to Khartoum, up the Nile, a bit like Peter used to know, and uh, then uh, up to Cairo, uh, where I converted onto hurricanes. Um, that was something of a surprise, but there were very few Spitfires in North Africa, or the desert as that was. It was indeed the hurricane that did most of the air cover from the El Alamein through to the final victory in Tunisia. I joined the front line part of the squadron and we started moving westwards at the time of El Alamein. The role of the hurricane had changed by now. It still did interception of bombers, but it also performed the role of a very efficient tank buster. The 40 mm gun fitted to some versions of the Hurricane was a formidable weapon against the German Panzers, even the Panzerkampfwagen IV. That went on all the way up through the desert, through Tripoli, and beyond Gabi's Monastir, up to Tunis. And it was at Tunis that the Germans made their last stand in North Africa. During this campaign, many hurricanes were used as night fighters and against German transport planes attempting to bring supplies and reinforcements to the remains of the Deutsche Afrika Corps. Victory in Tunisia and the end of all German presence in North Africa coincided with the demise of the hurricane as a fighter plane. Unlike the younger Spitfire, it could not be developed further. Despite its obvious limitations, the hurricane continued in service through to the end of the war and beyond, but in a different capacity. Besides being successful against tanks, both against the Germans in North Africa and against the Japanese in Burma, it was also the first Allied aircraft to be fitted with air-to-ground rockets, something that resulted in a newspaper headline claiming that the Hurricane packed a punch equivalent to the broadside of a destroyer. The last squadron to receive replacement for their Hurricanes was the RAF No. 6 Squadron in January 1947. But for all its apparent longevity, this little fighter should be remembered for some of its early achievements. As the first single-wing fighter plane breaking the biplane monopoly, and for its role during the Battle of Britain, for which it deserves far more recognition than it has been given. And, not least, it should be remembered for the brave men that flew her. And lots of chaps were killed. And his name does appear on the Runnymede Memorial, where there's another 20,000 names of aircrew 
with no known grave. When you're 18, the whole of life lies ahead of you, whatever job you're doing. And I suddenly looked round to my left and saw this 109 just out of my wingtip, virtually, which uh, gave me, I guess, <laughs> a nasty fright, to say the least of it. Anybody who says they were not frightened either had no imagination or was bullshitting me. I think everybody got frightened and terrified at the time. Thank you.